Good morning. My name's Amy McDonald. I'm the director of this space. Isn't it wonderful parents to have some place to go with your kids and they want to be there? Welcome to the mega, awesome, super huge, wicked fun podcast play date. I should have that memorized by now. How many, how many of the kids here listen to Circle Round? How many, how many have, is this the first time you're going to be meeting the voices behind the stories? So exciting. So today, they are going to be performing two folk tales. Sweet Corn and Clever Rabbit, Armadillo Song, and if you go to the table in the lobby afterwards, Rebecca will be signing copies of this for free, and we also have a bunch of Circle Round merchandise for sale, and you can meet her and ask her questions. At 10.30, when we finish the two stories, we'll be taking questions from you all. Kids take priority over their parents, so you'll be raising your hands, and Igor and I are going to be going around and picking who's going to ask the question. And then at 10.45, head to the lobby, and for our virtual audience, Eric Shimolanis, Shimolanis is going to be... Shimalonis, thank you. Igor, thank you. It's a mouthful. And he will be taking questions about uh, the musical instruments that they use during the show. So with no further ado, here is Circle Round. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Rebecca Shear, and what a thrill to circle around with you live. It's been years. Thank you. Whether you are in the room or at home, we are thrilled to have each and every one of you join us. So thanks for coming out on this gorgeous day. Now, we're doing two stories today. And before we start, I would love to see a quick show of hands. How many of you have been listening to Circle Round for at least, let's say, a month? Wow. So How about two months? How about three months? Okay, so then you know that each and every episode is scored, it's accompanied by a different musical instrument, more often than not, played by the one, the only, Eric Shimalonis. You may know Eric as the mastermind behind the sound and music you hear on Circle Round. He's also my soulmate in both storytelling and life. Uh, we've been married about eight years now, and five of them we've been making Circle Round. So Eric, can you hold up the first instrument you'll be playing today? Any guesses what this instrument is called? Yes. Close. She says ukulele. It is a stringed instrument very much related to the ukulele. Chirongo. <laughs> Listen to this one. It is called the Chirongo. And the Chirongo is a stringed instrument from the South American country of Bolivia. And the Bolivian story we're about to perform tells the tale of how maybe, just maybe, the very first Chirongo came to be. So circle around everyone for Armadillo's song. In Spanish, the word armadillo means little armored one. And if you've ever seen the animal known as the armadillo, you'll know why. Armadillos have four legs, a snout shaped like a shovel, and a long tail. But most importantly, they have armor, a bony shell that covers most of their body. This armor is especially helpful when it comes to escaping predators. The armadillo rolls itself into a tiny ball and is protected by its tough shell. Pretty cool, right? Wow, long, long ago, deep, deep in the rainforest, there lived an armadillo who thought his armor was anything but cool. Why? Because so many of the other animals made fun of it. Hey, look, here comes little armored one. The rest of us have soft fur. Or shiny feathers. Or smooth skin. But armadillo's stuck with that funny little shell. 
Armadillo wished his shell could protect him from teasing, as well as it protected him from predators, but no such luck. So most of the time, Armadillo stayed in his burrow, snoozing away. (laughs) Then, once each morning and once each evening, he would get up... and drag his shell out of his burrow to eat. Mm, What do I feel like having? Some juicy beetles, perhaps? A colony of ants? I know. How about some tasty termites? But in Armadillo's mind, the best part about foraging wasn't the food. It was the music he heard while looking for that food. Ooh, the whistling and trilling of the parrots is especially beautiful today. And there are crickets. How do they chirp so gently? Here come the frogs croaking back and forth, back and forth. Talk about a tight rhythm section. You see, more than anything else in the world, Armadillo loved music. And more than anything else in the world, he longed to be a musician. Oh, what I wouldn't give to be able to sing. If only I knew how. Armadillo's yearning grew and grew. And then one day, he had an idea. (gasps) I know. What if I ask the other animals to teach me how to sing? They'll probably be so flattered that I asked. So, the next time Armadillo went out hunting for food, he paused beneath the palm trees where the parrots were whistling and trilling. Um, excuse me? Parrots? Parrots? Hi. Um, I, um, I have a quick question for you. The parrots ceased their singing and peered down at Armadillo. Yes? What is it, little armored one? Well, for a long time now, I've been admiring your whistling and trilling. It's so very beautiful. So I have to ask, can you teach me how to sing like you? The parrots exchanged a look. Teach you how to sing? Surely, you must be joking. Everybody knows armadillos can't sing. Maybe you can find someone to play your shell. Like a drum. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's not very nice. I was just asking a simple question. You know what? I'll go ask the crickets. Their chirping is so wonderfully gentle. They're bound to be more friendly. So Armadillo scuttled over to a patch of ferns where the crickets were chirping away. Hi there, crickets. How you doing? Look, I'm sorry to bother you, but I have a quick question. The crickets stopped their chirping and stared at Armadillo. Mm Mm-hmm. What's up, little armored one? Well, for a long time now, I've been enjoying your chirping. It's so lively and sweet, and I have to ask, can you teach me how to sing like you? The crickets widened their eyes. Teach you? How to sing? You've got to be kidding. It's a well-known fact that armadillos can't sing. Maybe you should find someone to play your Shell. Like a marimba. <laughs> <laughs> huh. So much for gentle. That was downright rude. But I'm not giving up. I'll go ask the frogs. Maybe they'll be more willing. So Armadillo made his way to the edge of the water, where the frogs were croaking back and forth as they lounged on lily pads. Hey, frogs? How's it hanging? Listen, I wonder if I could ask one quick question? The frogs halted their croaking and gazed at Armadillo. Yup. Uh, what can we do for you, little armored one? 
Well, for a long time now, I've been spellbound by your croaking. The rhythm, the pacing, the musicality. I have to ask, can you teach me how to sing like you? Well, knowing what you know about how the parrots answered Armadillo's question and the crickets, I'll bet you can guess what the frogs had to say. Teach you? How to sing? You must be pulling our leg. A singing armadillo? Yeah, right. Maybe you should find someone to play your shell. Like a maraca. (laughs) (laughs) Armadillo hung his head. Wow. Maybe they're right. Maybe the silly shell is the best I can hope for. I'll never be a singer. Never. Armadillo was about to creep back to his burrow and sleep when, never, he heard a voice. I wouldn't be so sure about never, little armored one. Stick with me and you'll be a singer forever. Um, excuse me? Who, who, who's that talking? Where are you? And what do you mean I can be a singer forever? Armadillo watched as out from under a bush crawled an old turtle. I mean exactly what I say, Armadillo. You can be a singer forever. The answer is in your shell. Armadillo rolled his eyes. Oh, I get it. You're making fun of me, just like everyone else does. Oh, Armadillo, use your shell as a drum, or a marimba, or a maraca. Sorry, but uh, I'm not interested in that. Turtle laughed. (laughs) Armadillo, look at me. I have a shell, too. The last thing I would do is make fun of yours. Huh. You've got a point there. So... What's all this about using my shell to sing? Turtle cocked her head to one side. Tell me, Armadillo, what is it about music that you love? Turtle's question made Armadillo's heart flutter. What is it about music that I love? Gosh, what is it about music that I don't love? Well, I love how music can... Take a heavy heart and make it light. I love how music can take everything you feel inside and bring it to bright, beautiful life. I love how music can last just a few moments, yet live on forever. Does that answer your question? It does, Armadillo. And you'll be able to do all those things and more, thanks to your shell. Okay, Turtle, now you've lost me again. (laughs) Turtle smiled. Listen, Armadillo, here's what I want you to do. Go on, live your life, and come back to me when you are very, very old. Then, and only then, I promise I will help you make music that, like you say, lives on forever. But for now, you must continue to enjoy the music of others. Can you be okay with that? Armadillo thought about the parrots, and the crickets, and the frogs, and how they had all made fun of his shell. But then he thought about their beautiful music, and Turtle's promise that one day he would make music like that too. He took a deep breath. All right, Turtle. I can be okay with that. Over the years that followed, Armadillo put up with his share of razzing about his shell, but it didn't bother him. Not when he knew that someday that shell would help him make glorious music. Eventually, Armadillo grew old. His claws hurt, his snout ached, and it was getting harder and harder to drag his armor around to go foraging. One day, as Armadillo was about to trudge back to his burrow and rest, he heard a familiar voice. Hello, little armored one. Slowly, 
Armadillo turned around and smiled at his old friend. Hello, Turtle. Is it finally time to make music? Turtle nodded. It is finally time to make music. Return to your burrow, go to sleep, and we can begin. So Armadillo did as Turtle said. He went back to his burrow and snuggled in tight. He fell asleep with a smile on his face and never woke up. The next day, Turtle took Armadillo's shell and polished it till it gleamed. Then she took a set of guitar strings and strung them across the shell's hollow side. She attached a long wooden neck with tuning pegs at the top and created the very first Chirongo, a Bolivian guitar that makes bright, beautiful music bursting with life. Before long, many, many musicians were playing the Chirongo all across the land. Eventually, most Chirongos were made of wood, not armadillo, but they were decorated to look exactly like that tough little shell. Oftentimes, the Chirongo's music would reach the rainforest, and when it did, the parrots would cease their whistling and trilling, the crickets would stop their chirping, the frogs would halt their croaking, and every single animal would sit and listen to the little armored one who, at long last, had finally learned to sing. Does anyone else tear up at the end of that story? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little misty. Yeah. <laughs> That's the great thing about Circle Round. Our stories run the gamut. Some of them are laugh out loud funny, some pull at your heartstrings, some do both. But one of the coolest things about making Circle Round, I have to tell you, next to meeting our fans like you, is the research. Eric can tell you I spend hours every day digging through all of these amazing books from the library to find the folk tales we tell. And what I'm learning is some stories come from just one country, one region of the world, one people, one tradition. But others come from many, many places, often a mixture of places you wouldn't expect, like the story we're about to perform. Versions of this tale have roots in Mexico and Costa Rica and Canada, where it's been told among the people of the First Nations. And does anyone know uh, which instrument Eric is holding right now? Which instrument he's going to play? Banjo. Banjo, that's right, the banjo. So without further ado, circle around everyone for sweet corn and clever rabbit. Rabbit was one of the fastest animals around. She also was one of the cleverest. Her mind was every bit as quick as her feet. And being a bit of a rascal, Rabbit was especially fond of using her smarts to hatch schemes and play tricks. This story is about one of those tricks. It all began one morning when Rabbit was hopping around a part of the countryside she'd never seen before. After scurrying up a hill and around a bend, she saw something that stopped her right in her tracks. Whoa! Before her was a massive field of corn. Row after row of bright green stalks stretched up toward the sky, and each stalk was bursting with plump, sweet cobs. Mmm, all this hopping around sure has me hungry. I think I'll have a nibble. Rabbit, rabbit snatched a cob and shucked off the bright green husk. She took a bite. Mmm, -hmm. wow. <laughs> This is the freshest, sweetest corn I've ever tasted. As she chewed on the corn with her sharp teeth, her sharp mind began chewing on a plan. You know, I can think of a bunch of animals who'd love a taste of corn this sweet. I bet I could sell a thousand bushels of this stuff. I'd be rich. Then it occurred to her, this field must belong to a farmer. 
And farmers do not appreciate finding rabbits in their fields, especially rabbits who are snatching all their corn. But remember, Rabbit was speedy. She figured she could pick at least one bushel without getting caught. There was just one problem. How can I get rich selling just one bushel of corn? Ah, aha! I know just what to do. In the blink of an eye, Rabbit darted down a row of stalks and grabbed a few dozen corn cobs, exactly one bushel's worth. She tossed the cobs in an old burlap sack she found and dragged them back to her burrow. Once there, she brushed her fur, smoothed her whiskers, and put on her most winning smile. Then she grabbed three cobs of corn and hippity-hopped to the old rotting log where Cockroach lived. Good morning, Cockroach. Mm, good morning, Rabbit. What brings you here today? Well, let's just say I have a business proposition for you. Tell me, Cockroach, do you like corn? The insect's tiny eyes lit up. Like corn? I love it! I thought so. Listen, I'm selling one bushel of the freshest, sweetest corn you've ever tasted. And I wanted you to be the first to know about it. Me? Really? Yes, you. Here, have a bite. Rabbit handed a cob to Cockroach. <laughs> mm, this is the freshest, sweetest corn I've ever tasted. What are you asking for this one bushel of fresh, sweet corn? For you, Rabbit grinned. Five silver pieces. Cockroach nearly jumped out of his shell. Uh, five silver pieces? That's it? What a bargain! What can I say? I aim to please. So, what do you say, Cockroach? You in? Cockroach thought for a moment. This seemed like an offer he couldn't refuse. Yeah, I'm in. Fantastic. Meet me outside my burrow in exactly one hour. No sooner... No later. And don't forget your five silver pieces. Will do. See you in exactly one hour. As Rabbit leapt away, she smiled to herself. My plan is working. I'm going to make a fortune. <laughs> Rabbit's next stop was a mushy, marshy spot beside the river where Duck lived. Good morning, Duck. Greetings, Rabbit. What brings you here today? Well, let's just say I have a business proposition for you. Tell me, Duck, do you like corn? Duck's tail feathers quivered. Ooh, I love corn! Almost as much as I love creepy crawlies. You know, worms, slugs, cockroaches. I knew it. Listen, I'm selling one bushel of the freshest, sweetest corn you've ever tasted. And I wanted you to be the first to know about it. Me? You don't say. I do say. Here, have a bite. Rabbit handed a cob to Duck. Mmm! This is the freshest, sweetest corn I've ever tasted. Mmm! What are you asking for this one bushel of fresh, sweet corn? For you, Rabbit beamed. Five silver pieces. Duck let out a surprised quack. Quack! <laughs> Just five silver pieces? That's unheard of. What can I say? I aim to please. So, what do you say, Duck? You in? Duck thought for a moment. This seemed like an offer she couldn't refuse. Yes, indeed. I'm in. Outstanding. Meet me outside my burrow in exactly one hour and one minute. No sooner, no later. And don't forget your five silver pieces. Absolutely. See you in exactly one hour and one minute. As Rabbit bounced away, she had an extra spring in her step. This is easier than I thought. Just one more stop to go. Rabbit made her way to a thick cluster of bushes in the middle of the forest. 
where Fox lived. Before we go on, one thing you should know about Fox. Like Rabbit, he also was one of the cleverest animals around. And like Rabbit, he also was a very cunning trickster. All right, back to the story. Good morning, Fox. Hey there, Rabbit. What brings you here today? Well, let's just say I have a business proposition for you. Tell me, Fox, do you like corn? Fox's red ears perked up. I love corn. Almost as much as I love little critters. You know, foxes, rather, frogs, mice, ducks. I figured... Listen, I'm selling one bushel of the freshest, sweetest corn you've ever tasted, and I wanted you to be the first to know about it. Hmm, I like the sound of that. As you should. Here, have a bite. Rabbit handed a cob to Fox. Mm. Mm. Oh, this, is, this is the freshest, sweetest corn I've ever tasted. So, uh, what are you asking for this bushel of fresh, sweet corn? For you, Rabbit smiled. Five silver pieces. Fox cocked his head. Wait, really? Just five silver pieces? That's a steal. What can I say? I aim to please. So, what do you say, Fox? You in? Fox thought for a moment. This sure seemed like an offer he couldn't refuse, but it sounded way too good to be true. Was Rabbit up to one of her sneaky tricks again? There was only one way to find out. Uh, sure, Rabbit. I'm in. Splendid. Meet me outside my burrow in exactly one hour and two minutes. No sooner, no later. And don't forget your five silver pieces. You betcha. See you in exactly one hour and two minutes. As Rabbit dashed back to her burrow, Fox sat puzzling and pondering in his den. Hmm, that rascal Rabbit is up to something. But what? I know. I'll sneak over to her burrow right now. I'll hide out of sight and see what kind of game she's playing. Something tells me Rabbit's sweet corn offer doesn't have a kernel of truth. Cockroach may have been delighted about Rabbit's deal. Duck, too. But Wily Fox knew something wasn't right. A few moments after Rabbit sprung away from his den, Fox scurried to her burrow and hid behind a bush. Before long, he spotted Cockroach scuttling over. Hi there, Rabbit. Well, hello, Cockroach. Has it been one hour already? You're right on time. Did you bring your five silver pieces? I sure did. Here you go. Thank you. Rabbit shoved Cockroach's five silver pieces into her left pocket. Okay, so where's that sweet corn? Oh, it's right here in this sack. Oh, no. Cockroach froze. What? What's the matter? Oh, I hate to say it, but here comes Duck. You know how she loves to eat cockroaches. You better go hide. I'll let you know when it's safe to come back. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, thanks, Rabbit. See you soon. As Cockroach scuttled behind a rock, Duck waddled up to Rabbit's burrow. Good day, Rabbit. Well, hello, Duck. Has it been one hour and one minute already? You're right on time. Did you bring your five silver pieces? Indeed I did. Here they are. Thank you. Rabbit's left pocket was full of cockroaches' five silver pieces, so she dropped Duck's five silver pieces into her right pocket. All right, so where can I find that sweet corn? Oh, it's right here in this sack. Uh-oh. Duck froze. What? What's wrong? I hate to say it, but here comes Fox. You know how he loves to eat ducks. You better go hide. I'll let you know when it's safe to come back. Oh dear, 
Thank you, Rabbit. I'll see you shortly. As Duck shuffled behind a tree, Rabbit looked around and frowned. Hmm. I told Fox to come over in one hour and two minutes, and now he's late. I wonder where he could be. Now, we know that Fox had been watching all this time, right? Right? But Rabbit didn't know that. So, you can imagine how startled she was when, all of a sudden, Fox jumped out from behind the bush where he had been hiding. I'm right here, Rabbit. Fox? Uh, how'd you get behind that bush? Uh, what have you been doing? Fox smiled, his pointy white teeth glinting in the sun. What have I been doing? Oh, you know, just listening to you sell the same bushel of corn twice and give nothing in return. Rabbit's mind raced. Oh, <laughs> oh that! I can explain everything. You see, Fox, my plan was to sell all the corn to you. You and you alone. Really? Truly. Before Rabbit knew what was happening, Fox bounded over to the rock and pulled Cockroach out of his hiding place. He did the same with Duck behind the tree. Rabbit watched as the three animals, Cockroach, Duck, and Fox, went in to a huddle. After whispering amongst themselves, they turned to Rabbit and began to speak using some very familiar words. So, uh, listen, Rabbit. We have a business proposition for you. The three of us are going to split a bushel of the freshest, sweetest corn you've ever tasted. And it'll only cost you... Ten, ten silver, silver pieces. pieces. The five you stole from me. And the five you stole from me. So, what do you say, Rabbit? You, you win? win? Rabbit hung her head. She knew they were making an offer she couldn't refuse. Yup. I'm in. So, the three new friends, Cockroach, Duck, and Fox, split the corn three ways and enjoyed every fresh, sweet bite. But even sweeter was the lesson they learned that day. Don't trust everything you hear. If something sounds too good to be true, most likely it is. In fact, it's probably just another hair-brained scheme. What a treat to perform Circle Round live in front of you, whether you're here live or virtually. Um, before we go to the q and I would love for us to give a big circle round of applause for our actors today. Jeffrey Song, <laughs> Emily DiPietro, <laughs> Camelia Farms, Luis Negron, and of course, our mastermind of sound and music, Eric Shimalones. Quick reminder to those of you watching at home, um, coming up in just a few minutes, Eric will be doing a Q&A and demo of his two instruments today, the banjo and the charango, so stick around. But first, we would love to take questions from our live audience. If there's something you've been burning to know about Circle Round, its creators, its stories, its performers, if so, raise your hand and we'll do our best to answer your question. <laughs> he has a very pertinent question. How did they switch voices in every single story? Great question for our actors. Who would like to talk about that? Um, I'm happy to, to talk about that. So, um, so something I did when I was thinking about, I, I, I looked at what the animals would be, and I thought about, so I was thinking about a tiger, and I thought, oh, a tiger probably has a, a, a low voice, and they have fur, so I want to make it sound really smooth. Or a snake has a lot of hissing sound. So I really thought about the animal, and I tried to make them come out of my mouth <laughs> in a vocal way. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know why the, the logo is a lion. Good question. That's a very good question. Why the logo is a lion. Well, we've been working with an artist. Does anyone know the artist's name from the closing credits? Sabina. Aww. Sabina Han. 
<laughs> we were working with her from the very Super beginning. Nice. And um, we actually held auditions for artists. One of the first stories that I wrote was called The Lion's Whisker. If you've heard that episode from Ethiopia, it's from our first season. Who's heard The Lion's Whisker? About the sister and brother who cannot get along. <laughs> right, so that was one of the first stories we wrote and it was long before the podcast came out to the public. And we were auditioning artists. We sent them the script and said, can you draw us a picture that you think would represent this story in a way that young listeners would love? And Sabina drew that lion and we just, we chose her. And there was something about the lion that was just so iconic. And the original picture had the little boy and girl, we don't see that version here, but the little boy and girl sort of balancing on the whiskers. And it was almost like the lion was leading children to come and listen to a story. And somehow the lion has become our logo. We have yet to give the lion a name. So if anyone has an idea for what we might name the lion, um, feel free to let us know because it's been five years now and maybe it's about time that he has a name. <laughs> okay, ready? Oh, you think about it. No, can, I, can I? Can I? Yeah. He wants to know how you decide which which um, characters you put in the story. That's a great question too. Which characters do we put in the story? A lot of it's based on the source material. If I find um, sometimes I find these old wonderful folktale books or brand new reinterpretations and see what characters they use. Very oftentimes we have to condense it. Um, Stella and the Dragon, for instance, our second episode ever, which listeners, it's one of our listeners' favorites, you only hear the voices of Stella, the dragon, and one of her daughters. Um, we chose not to have all the children because she has 100 of them. <laughs> and you actually don't hear from her husband, Ovi. We wanted to make it her story. So we decided let's have two main voices and also hear one of the kids. Other times we'll add a character or we'll change. Stella, for instance, in the original version from Romania is named Stan. And we thought, why does the man have to be the one to fight the dragon? Let's make it a woman. So we do also play around with things like that. We change ages, we change genders, an animal could become a person, vice versa. So we try to stay true to the original while also having a little bit of fun. How do you make the story? How do we make the stories? That is a big process, and I'm going to talk just for a second and let Eric take over, because my job is to do the writing. So I try to find every version of the story out there, whatever author wrote the version, whatever country it's from, whatever tradition, and I read them, and I sort of do this mishmash and blend them together and add some circle around magic and make the script. And then everything is up to Eric in terms of editing our actor's lines, making music and sound, and I'll let him talk about that process. Well, I can tell you, I watched Rebecca write these. It's part of our lives, and she puts so much of her <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears and love into these stories. And really, once it comes to me, it's so clear in the script how the flow of a story works and what the music should be. And her work, along with the work of the original source material of the folktale, just make it utterly clear to me what the instrument has to be, how it should sound, how it should flow. And then um, we, uh, in two separate phases, get to work together on this beautiful thing. And um, of course, it comes back to Rebecca to give it the final listen and make sure I did everything just the way she imagined, because that's very important. And she's always right. <laughs> <laughs> That was a great answer. <laughs> What's your favorite show that you wrote? That's like asking Stella which of her 100 kids she likes the best. Um, <laughs> including the Circle Round Shorties, which was sort of a mini uh, episode series we did last year. We have 170 at this point. Oh boy, how do I choose? Usually I just say the most recent one. <laughs> um, so for now, it's Friends in High Places with Mario Cantone and Denise Crosby. It was so much fun writing for an, a giraffe and a rhinoceros. That was the first time we ever had a giraffe and rhinoceros on Circle Round, and that was super fun. How do you decide which instrument to use? Mm. Eric. Yeah, of course. Sometimes, because these, these folk tales are all from very specific countries or regions, like... I knew that we had a Bolivian story coming, and I've always loved the sound of this instrument. It, it's 
Thank you. It has Boy. double strings for each. It's a little like a ukulele. It's a little like a mandolin. And authenticity is important a lot of times. So I actually engaged a Bolivian charango maker to make this. And it took a little while. So luckily, I had the foresight. Um, and we ordered it, and it arrived in this cool box from Bolivia. And so very specific choice. Sometimes that's not true. Sometimes stories are from so many places that I, I have some latitude. I could choose maybe any instrument. Then it's sort of the flavor of the story or the tone of the story that might have me pick something. Stella and the Dragon was a double bass because it just seemed with the, the weight of the dragon and the strength of Stella that a, a bass-centered instrument would be good. And the way that that instrument functions just really was another character in the story. And that's another strength we have. We chose this. We selected early on to use only a solo instrument. There's never two or an ensemble, except for Boston Symphony Orchestra things, which is a tree <laughs> too. But having one singular instrument as another player in the story is a really neat functional aspect, and we really like that too. But um, so to summarize, sometimes the country of origin helps me to choose an instrument from that country or region. And sometimes I get to just sort of pick the voice that fits the story the best. Okay, you ready? <laughs> Why are the lion's eyes green? <laughs> I wish Sabina was here. She could answer that question. I tell you what, I will send her an email right after this and ask her why, because I never even thought to ask that question. We'll get back to you. <laughs> when... Why do you wh why did you pick to be a storyteller? Ooh. Well, once upon a time, I was a public radio reporter and host. So I told <laughs> stories for grown-ups. I worked for NPR and a bunch of NPR stations. I started out at Iowa Public Radio when I was in grad school. Then I went to Alaska Public Radio where I hosted a show across the state. Wound up in Washington, D.C. at WAMU 88.5, where I filled in at NPR, newscast, all things considered. I would do newscast. I would host. Um, and I loved telling stories for grown-ups. I really did. And I remember once a listener wrote in to say, Rebecca sure sounds like she's reading to a class of kindergartners. <laughs> and she meant it in like a mean way. And I took it as such a compliment. I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> Maybe I should tell stories to kindergartners. I have a kindergartner. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So um, when I met Eric, we started dreaming of starting a, a business together. He did all this beautiful music. I could write and talk kind of pretty. Um, and we ended up in the children's podcasting space, telling stories to kindergartners of all ages. This is going to be our last question, appropriately enough, from one of our reporter's daughters. But all you kids who still have questions, Rebecca will answer them out in the lobby. So here's our last question. Um, how do you know which one you want to make each time you do one? How do I know which story I want to make? Well, like I said, I spend hours and hours going through books. I take out more books than anyone else at my local library. The librarian told me I kind of win the unofficial uh, gold medal for that. <laughs> and as I read through stories, I think, will this be a good fit for Circle Round? Um, does it strike that nice balance between not too sad, maybe not too silly? Does it pull at your heartstrings? Is there a lesson that we can teach? That's a big thing. We want to communicate these universal themes like persistence and generosity and creativity and honesty. So does the story do a nice job of, of putting something in there that listeners can take away? Are there enough characters? Are there too many characters? Is it too confusing? If it's too confusing, if there are some folktales that are like 50 pages long in some of these books, and I think that's probably not a fit for Circle Round. Our episodes are all 18 to 25 minutes long. So at this point, five years in, I sort of have a feel for what makes a good circle round story. That said, I am always looking for new folk tales. So circle round at WBUR.org is our address. If you come across a bedtime story, a folk tale, a fable, a legend that you are reading as a family that you think it would be great for us to adapt, please email us the title. Let us know. Always looking for more source material. Um, I guess that's all the time we have. Um, so like I, I say pretty much all the time, I'm Rebecca Shear. Thanks for circling around with us. Hey. <laughs>